Okay, welcome gang. We're going to start today with a quick overview of the book of Titus, and we're going to learn a little bit about how Paul was speaking into a Greek world and, uh, and had some really important things for the church today. And so as we begin, let's look at the Bible project as a way of helping us get started. Paul's letter to Titus. Titus was a Greek follower of Jesus who was for years a trusted co-worker and traveling companion of Paul's. He had helped Paul in a number of crisis situations in the past, and in this letter we discover that Paul had assigned him the task of going to Crete, a large island off the coast of Greece, to restore order to a network of house churches. Now, Cretan culture was notorious in the ancient world. One of the Greek words for being a liar was kretidzo, to be a Cretan. These people were infamous for treachery and greed. Most of the men on the island had served as mercenary soldiers to the highest bidder, and the island cities were known as being unsafe, plagued by violence and sexual corruption. However, the island of Crete had many strategic harbors, and they serviced cities all over the ancient Mediterranean Sea. And so, from Paul's point of view, Crete was the perfect place to start a network of churches. Now, we don't know the details, but somehow these churches came under the influence of corrupt Cretan leaders. They said they were Christians, but they were ruining the churches. And so, Paul assigned Titus with the task of going there to set things straight, and this letter provided the instructions. It has a pretty straightforward design. After a brief introduction, Paul gives Titus clear instructions about his tasks in the church. He then offers guidance about the new kind of household and then about the new kind of humanity that the gospel could create in these Cretan communities. Paul then closes the letter with some final greetings. So Paul opens the whole thing by reminding Titus that his message as an apostle is about the hope of eternal life, that is, the life of the new creation, that is available starting now through Jesus the Messiah. And this hope was promised long ago by the God who does not lie. Now, this little opening comment introduces an important theme underlying the whole letter. One of the problems in the Cretan churches was that they had assimilated their ideas about Jesus, the Christian God, to their ideas about the Greek gods that they grew up with, specifically Zeus, their chief god. Cretan people claimed that Zeus was actually born on their island, and they loved to tell stories and mythologies about Zeus's underhanded character. He would seduce women and lie to get his way. And Paul wants to be really clear. The God revealed through Jesus is totally different than Zeus. His basic character traits are faithfulness and truth, which means the Christian way of life will be about truth also, which will be a real change for these Cretans. So Paul then addresses Titus with a twofold task. He says the first one is to appoint new leaders for each church community, a team of what he calls elders, mature husbands or fathers whose way of life is totally different from Cretan culture. They are to be known for integrity, total devotion to Jesus, for self-control and generosity, both in their families and in the community at large. And these new leaders are to teach the good news about Jesus and replace the corrupt leaders who need to be confronted. That's Titus's second task. Paul identifies the teachers as those of the circumcision. In other words, they were ethnically Jewish Cretans who said that they followed Jesus, but similar to the problems in Galatia, these people demanded that non-Jewish Christians be circumcised and follow the laws of the Torah if they really wanted to become followers of the Jewish Messiah. Paul says that they're obsessed with Jewish myths and human commands. And to top it off, they're just in the church leadership business to make money. And so Paul, in a brilliant move, he pulls a quote from an ancient Cretan poet, Epimenides, who was very frank and honest about the character of his own people. He said Cretans are always liars, vicious beasts, and lazy gluttons. They blur the lines between true and false, between good and evil, and they're just in it for the money. And so while these leaders claim to know God, their Cretan way of life denies him. They have to be dealt with. And this leads Paul into the next section. Because of these corrupt leaders, many Christians in these churches now have homes and personal lives that are a total wreck. And three different times, Paul highlights the result of all this. The message about Jesus is discredited. Their non-Christian neighbors now have good cause to make evil accusations. And all of this makes the teaching about God our Savior totally unattractive and not compelling to anybody. So Paul paints a picture of the ideal Cretan household that is devoted to Jesus. 
It would be elderly men and women who are full of integrity and self-control, so they can become models of character to the young people. And the young women shouldn't be sleeping around and avoiding marriage, as was fashionable in Crete at the time, but rather they should be looking for faithful partners so they can raise stable, healthy families. And the young men are to do the same. They're to be known as productive, healthy citizens. Christian slaves on Crete were in a unique position because we know that because of the gospel, they were treated as equals in Paul's church communities. However, there was a danger that they would use that equality as license to disrespect their masters and then become associated with slave rebellions, which would further discredit the Christian message. You can see Paul negotiating a fine line here. He believes that the gospel about Jesus needs to prove its redemptive power in the public square if it's really going to transform Cretan culture. And that's not going to happen through social upheaval or by Christians cloistering away from urban life. The Christian message will be compelling to Cretans when Christians fully participate in public life, when their lives and homes look similar on the surface. Because after a closer look, their neighbors will discover that Christians live by a totally different value system system out of devotion to a totally different God. And that's the difference that Paul beautifully summarizes at the end of chapter 2. He says the value system driving the Christian way of life is God's generous grace, which appeared in the person of Jesus and will appear again at his return. This grace was demonstrated when Jesus gave up his honor to die a shameful death on behalf of his enemies so that he could rescue and redeem them. And it's that same grace that calls God's people to say no to corrupt ways of life that are inconsistent with the generous love of God. Paul then zooms out from the Christian household to a vision of Christians living like new humans in Cretan society. Of all people, Christians should be known as the ideal citizens, peaceable, generous, obedient to authorities, known for pursuing the common good. But this is really different from how Cretans grew up. How are Christians supposed to sustain this countercultural way of life? And Paul believes the power source is the transforming love of the three-in-one God announced in the gospel. And he explores this with a really beautiful poem. He says, God's kindness and love are what saved us, despite ourselves, so that through the Holy Spirit, God washed and rebirthed and renewed people And through Jesus has provided a way for people to be declared right before him. And all of this opens up eternal life. That is, a new future in the new creation. This living story is so powerful, it can produce new kinds of people. Paul's convinced that spirit-empowered faithfulness to the teachings of Jesus will declare God's grace all over the island of Crete and all over the world. Paul concludes by promising to send backup for Titus, either Artemis or Tychicus, and then he says hello to their common friends. And so the letter ends. The letter of Titus shows us Paul's missionary strategy for churches to become agents of transformation within their communities. It won't happen by waging a culture war or by assimilating to the Cretan way of life. Rather, he calls these Christians to wisely participate in Cretan culture. They need to reject what's corrupt, but also embrace what's good there. If they can learn to live peaceably and devote themselves to Jesus and to the common good, Christians will, in his words, show the beauty of the message about our saving God. And that's what the letter to Titus is all about. You know, Mark, one thing that was interesting to me at the end of that video was this idea of the the missionary status and and not, um, how did he put it, Um, not the counterculturism but wise participation in the culture. Yeah. Yeah, be part of that culture and, and navigate your faith story in the midst of it so that you might live peacefully. You know, that I liked how he also quoted the Cretan, uh, uh, what was it, Epicurus? Yeah. Yeah. And so that yeah, kind of leaning into the culture, demonstrating even how to do that. It's like uh, in the letter, we see how to how to be part of the culture and to leverage the culture for the cause of Christ. And uh, I think that's a, a noteworthy moment for us as, uh, as we're living in not a dissimilar culture. I was, I was listening and I was thinking to myself, man, if I could be a pastor uh, of anywhere other than Cretan. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I am in Cretan, <laughs> you know, so. 
Oh, that's great. Well, should we dive into the dive into the reading? Yeah, if you want, you can send the host back to me now. It's up to you. In the meantime, why don't I read two pages and I'll pick up here at the letter to the Titus and uh, then we'll uh, send it on and I'll let Amanda bring it on home. Sound good? Sounds so, good. From Macedonia, Paul is about to leave for Nicolopolis, Nicolopolis in uh, Greece where he has decided to spend the winter and where he expects Titus to join him. Before leaving, he writes a letter to Titus whom he had earlier left in Crete. Titus is apparently facing some of the challenges as Timothy in his efforts, as Timothy in his efforts to preserve doctrinal purity and establish effective local congregations. Therefore, Paul's letter to Titus bears a resemblance to his letter to Timothy in its emphasis on false teaching, church organization, and instruction in Christian living. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time and which now at his appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true son, and in our common faith, grace and peace from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Savior. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town, as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deceptions, deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting, disrupting whole households by teaching things that they ought not to teach and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of the Crete's own prophets said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to merely human co commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Now regarding older men, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Regarding the older women, likewise teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. 
For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the Lord of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself the people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient to the to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, or to, to be peace, peaceable and considerate and always be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We live in malice, we lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of our God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. As soon as I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me to Nicopolis because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way, to, on their way and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Don't you, I love this, uh, this part right here about quarreling. Uh, avoid, avoid foolish controversies. And a lot of their controversies were coming out of the genealogy arguments of uh, kind of what families were great, where, where authority was rested and seated. You know, you have, you have the, the whole continually uh, throughout a lot of the New Testament, this, this who's greater, where does authority get seated? Is it, is it with the rabbis? No, is it with the Sadducees? Is it no, with the Pharisees? Where's authority in the church? Is it with the elders? Is it with the pastor? Is it with the apostle? Where does authority get seated? Is it with the men? Is it with the women? How does, how does that all work? And, and the idea of who gets to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, who gets to sit on the right hand of Jesus, you know, is it's, I want to be on the right hand is, and so there's this constant thing inside of uh, the human heart that continually has to be addressed throughout all, so many of these texts about, wait a second, time out. It isn't about who gets to be greater it's who gets to serve like Christ served and, and how does that work and put an end to this quarrels. Uh, these are unprofitable. They are useless. Uh, and then I love warn a divisive person, right? Cause divisiveness is never okay. It's like inside of this church culture being divisive, unacceptable. It's, it's never, it's never okay. And, uh, we are as guilty as that today as, uh, ever because it's in the human heart it's just it's part of the, the the very fabric and the nature of that old self that is and has been dying as people give their lives to christ but is it's one of those intentionalities that we have to bring to bear 
to put that to death, to starve that, um, you know, that, that whole imagery of the two dogs and, and whichever one is going to win in your life, the, the, the white dog or the black dog, the sinful dog or the righteous dog, the dog that wins is the dog that gets fed. So you have to feed the righteous dog as we're putting to death this old self uh, and uh, allowing that old self to come to, to an end as we move more and more in the imaging of Christ. And uh, that's really, I think, a lot of the call of this book to the Cretes is to put to death this old self and become increasingly image bearers of the king, who that is who we really are. It seemed that the Cretan culture was more leaning toward the Greeks and the Greek gods and, and the, the, the adding in the Roman gods, but more the Greek gods to me. Do you love that uh, Zeus was like their main guy and he's, he's a scoundrel? You know, it's like, wait a second. We just, as we're, as we're establishing this faith, Titus, you cannot allow the church to let Christ emulate in any way the Zeus or any of these other gods. What we are doing as Christ followers is so fundamentally different than the culture. And yet don't not be part of this culture, you know? And, uh, and so that construct is so relevant today. It's just so real to me that we face some of the, some of the very similar challenges uh, in our day that Titus was up against. Did you like the part, Mark, where it said, uh, warn them once, warn them twice, but after that, have nothing to do with them? Yeah, it's like, you know, okay, wash your hands. Of, I mean, uh, understand, they're, they're a brother, they're a sister, maybe, but they're argumentative, and they're divisive, and they're problem stirrers, and, uh, and you got to walk away from those relationships. That they don't benefit the church, and they won't benefit you either, you know, so... Uh, it's hard to walk away it's important to remember that the goal still even when you you warn them and then you have nothing to do with them is still for them to find repentance right you yeah. know i think that some people hang on to this as a way of you know i we had this dispute in our family and you know i've told them a number of times and maybe what is right is god has told you you need to separate um but i think the goal is still reconciliation i mean i think that's what <laughs> God desires is that person to repent, to change their sinful ways, and then be able to come back and again create that unity rather than divisiveness. But it is certainly, I don't think, you know, something that Christians should hang on to as a way to be, you know, spiteful or bitter or unforgiving. Um, it's it's meant for correction and has a purpose, and it certainly, I think, um, when used correctly, is necessary, especially within families in the church and things like that. But um, you know, and just think that there's been times where people have twisted scripture for their own, you know, heart desires and that we just need to know that God always desires unity in the end. Yeah. So this would be a time where, like you're saying, Amanda, that, uh, why, why then would you have nothing to do with someone for a, a span of time or a season? Well, you know, I, um, we, I had a really long struggle with my, um, my in-laws. And looking back, a lot of it, I think, was me. But um, when we started to reshape our faith, it seemed like our tension in our relationship with Dustin's parents got um, even worse to the point where we struggled having any kind of pleasurable experience when we were together. And um, we were trying to reestablish our marriage and our faith. And we finally just said, we need a break um, because we don't want to ruin the relationship. Uh, we tried so many times to address things directly, both sides did, and we just couldn't repair it. And we separated and, um, and at that time it was very painful and it felt like this may ruin our relationship. You know, I don't think we can, you know, are we ever going to be able to fix this? And I will say in that time of separation, I think God worked on all of our hearts individually and that it kind of became like a dating relationship then once we took some time apart and then it was, okay, we'll spend one time together. Okay, that went well. It was really short, brief, and we'll try it again. And then it became more frequent, longer visits. And I will tell you that um, my relationship with them is so 
profoundly better. Um, there was bitterness that God has resolved and there has been forgiveness stated on every side. And it has been like a new beginning in our relationship. And that, um, I mean, it's created some emotions on both sides of this is something I didn't even know to pray for because I didn't think it was possible. And it is such a wonderful relationship now that it, and it's another testament that uh, Dustin and I have in our life to say that God can restore even the most broken relationships because we've experienced not only with each other, but also with his parents. And it is, it's wonderful on the other side when you let God work in those kind of situations. Now, for those of you who are maybe attending to the chat a little bit as Amanda was talking, as Ginny breaks out laughing as Amanda is pouring out her heart, uh, <laughs> I had sent a, I had sent Ginny <clears throat> a private message and she responded to everybody. And so uh, I so I sent it to her and the and the panelists so they knew I'd responded. But <laughs> I thought that, that maybe a clarification that uh, Amanda, if you look down at the chat, she wasn't laughing. Uh, with you she was just laughing at you no she wasn't well, laughing at you she was laughing good, at something i said yeah some people a good relationship with a mother-in-law might be you know laughable yeah. so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean to the pure all things are pure what, it, what do you think paul was driving at there mark when i when i look at that one of the things i wonder about is that if if someone is pure of heart then um you know the the, the things that they do are done out of a, a spirit of purity, whether it's, you know, I know Paul talks often about, you know, the, the letter of the law relative to food and things, you know, of that nature. But, but if, if my heart is pure, if my intentions are good, whatever, whatever actions I'm taking, I'm wondering if that's, if that's what he means by that, you know, that when your motives are pure, you know, you, it's like you can trust this person that they're really doing their best to do the right thing. You know, I think I think that you're you're on to it. I mean, the real issue of you know pure and impure in the scripture has to do with what's ceremonial ceremonially clean or not clean. Or and Paul's saying, wait a second, time out. We just got to step back and say, um, inside of Christ, all things are permissible. Not all things are beneficial, but all things are permissible. Now, if somebody is able to, you know, eat to the glory of God, and someone else that find they find something that would be eaten a stumbling block. Uh, we're not, we're not going to judge the person who's able to eat whatever they want to eat. And, but that transcends food into a lot of different arenas. And, and it's like, you know what, if I can give thanks and glory to God for this, and I can pursue that with all integrity, uh, that that's, uh, that's a pure idea. There's nothing immoral often about something and, and what I'm really striving at always is this purity of heart, this authentic desire to honor Christ and to let his name be made known and to live my life for him. And if I'm doing that, if you're loving God and loving others, there's, there, there is no law. Uh, when you live that way, uh, the law is, is going to, the, the real genuine law of God is going to be, uh, uh, you're going to, you're going to do what needs to, uh, you're going to do the right things. I think sometimes what we find ourselves trying to do is not do certain things. And I think to Paul's point, it's like, stop trying not to do stuff and start doing what you're supposed to be doing. If you just did what you, what you should do, you wouldn't have time to do what you shouldn't do anyway. So do, do what you can do. And, uh, and you'll find that you don't have time to do what you can't, shouldn't do. So live your life doing, uh, love God, love people. And a lot of your problems are going to go away. You know, I, I was thinking that I'll, I think part of it too is if, you know, to the pure, um, and kind of to add on what you were saying, I think you assume the best intentions of other people's behavior as well. You know, if you're an envious person, you, I think, are, you filter everything you see through that envy and you think that everybody else's motion or motives are also driven by the same envy you have. Or, you know, if you're hungry for power, you are assuming everybody else's actions are, you know, moving towards gaining power. And so I think when you're impure, we tend to, whatever that impurity is, is what we tend to filter life through, you know? And so when you're unforgiving, you assume everybody else is being bitter and unforgiving towards you. So I just think that that's a big thing here is when you're pure and you get rid of those thoughts or you're working towards it, 
all things are pure. You see people in that pure form that I think, you know, Christ saw. You see the heart and the, behind their motives. I think that Paul, you know, Peter had had the sheep lower down from heaven vision. And he had been taught through that before going to Cornelius that he had, uh, that what God has brought uh, what God has brought to us, all things are pure. I and this is Paul's take on that same subject. Uh, I, I I don't know if I'm reading that right or not, Mark, but maybe you can. Yeah, I I was uh, reading the other questions as you were talking, and I'll can you know in, in a spirit of true confession. So trying to decide where we're going to go for the remainder of our time, but. Hey, Dave, what do you think about the necessity of, uh, of leaders in the church? And, and I would use the term pastor and elder interchangeably, as the text so often does. But uh, uh, what, do you, what do you see? I mean, my, when I say that, what I mean is that often the same word is used, translated into either elder and or pastor. Um, but how do you see those? I believe that all pastors are elders. Yeah, I don't know if that's true or not, but I think as my, my understanding is that one of the elders was gifted with the gift of uh, pastoring or understanding mm -hmm. that in the leadership role, uh, there, is, there is to be one pastor and then under that pastor, there are to be lesser pastors or other elders. Who are given the responsibility of the leadership? I don't well, know if that's where you're going, Mark. Or yeah, well, so as Paul as Paul's organizing these churches, he's you know, I mean, he's a master church planter. I mean, he is he is causing churches all over to get started, and he wants them to be led well. Uh, why is it that appointing leaders is necessary rather than just having a democratic system of governance? Well, I think that, um, I mean, I think unity is a big part of it. Um, keeping a unified vision. You know, I think all of you as being church leaders that uh, a lot of people can get really caught up in their personal desires for the church functioning um, and lose sight of that bigger picture. And what actually stood out to me is the fact that it's plural, elders, leaders, um, and that I think it being a group um, with a common goal and that really, I think it's accountability for the church that, um, you know, a lot of our membership, if you're really displeased, there are other churches, there's other organizations you can go to have your needs met. But as being leaders, there's a group where they're holding one another accountable because, I mean, you can be on fire for Jesus one day and all it takes is a small foothold for Satan to come in and really dismantle a leader of a church. And so I think having other elders that have some outside discernment and a relationship together to be able to make those course corrections to keep the church focused on the purpose of Christ is really important that it's not just one person running the church without anybody else, you know, questioning why things are being done the way they are. What does it mean to show true humility, and particularly as we're thinking of inside of the church? The, the picture that keeps coming to my mind, Mark, is one that is one that you share so often. That um, that picture of service. How, how can I how can I serve you today? Is is the message that that I see coming through when, when you're when you're talking about humility? It's it's about what what can I do. To, sort, to serve you, to support you. And, and I think that's, that's a role of humility that, you know, of course, Jesus modeled very, very well. A heart of service. Well, and I think never losing the focus on we're all broken people, you know, that it's, um, you know, sometimes you get into leadership and, or you're refining your faith that, it's often to get built up on that pride. And I think that just remembering we're all broken and we need that, that daily grace uh, is an important part of humility. Mm -hmm. Mark, there's another word that comes to, uh, that I was thinking and that was the word presbyteros or mm -hmm. um, 
uh, in the leadership realm, uh, you know, I believe there's a reason that there is one pastor and then there are those under the pastor who have been, been given authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe there's a reason for that. One of the things that, um, you know, as I've now pastored for some time, and we, we are a uh, pastor-led, board-protected church. And so uh, I get to fly the plane, and I'm grateful for that. I do, I do it with a lot of consulting. We have air traffic control, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that go into making some of the decisions, but I look at a lot, how a lot of churches are, are organized. And it's like, a lot of times I look at some churches as if they're, they're allowing their first class passengers to fly the plane. And, uh, they, they, the, the boards that, that direct the pastor, it's like, a lot of them didn't get trained. They don't have, they don't have the knowledge to, to, they're not instrument trained, and, and so, but they all think they they want to, you know, take take control. And man, that just leads to so many problems often. And then there's some that just go, they go, wait a second, we really want to be a democratic system, so let's let all the passengers vote. Uh, do we go up or down, left or right? Do we? Uh, how do we? Uh, <laughs> should we start to land now? <laughs> you know, it's just like, well, wait a minute now. Uh, when you when you uh, have somebody piloting a plane it's better if the passengers keep their hands off the wheel but that's hard for a lot of passengers on a lot of planes because they don't want to just get to a destination they want to show you how to get to that destination and and that can be a that can be a rough ride so uh, as you're selecting churches you know there's a there's reason for good eldership to or good you know leadership in the church and then I would, uh, I would suggest to have good accountability uh, and to have a board that's able to really hold people accountable is, is really important. So accountability, if you're in an accountable system, there's very little to be afraid of. Whether you've entrusted in, my, in our church a million dollars, which is roughly our budget, you to trust me with a million dollars to manage, or you entrust me with one dollar, if I'm accountable for that, there's not very much risk. If you give me one staff or 10 staff, if I'm accountable for that, not a lot of risk. Uh, it's, it's in these, uh, where you've got a senior leader who's not accountable for anybody. I think you often see leadership running amok. Um, so getting the boards in place in churches where they protect the pastor from the, from the sheep because they bite, and you protect the sheep from a pastor that gets abusive, I think you wind up with a really sweet spot of a system to build a structure that can support uh, taking flight and uh, getting uh, people to an ultimate destination. And, uh, and I think we've struck a really nice balance at our church. And I appreciate being able to pilot that, uh, that plane. So, all right, let me uh, pray us out today. God, thank you so much for Titus and for the example that he has given us at pastoring people in Crete and how so many ways we can, uh, we can extrapolate some of the things that he experienced and uh, what Paul was teaching him. And we can see in, in that uh, some ways forward for us as a church in our culture. Help us to learn to live peacefully with people. Help us be part of the culture without uh, really being directed or, or embracing the culture. And help us learn to reflect Christ in a way that really does Father, bring you uh, a smile. So we want your, your son's name to be glorified in our lives and in our midst. And uh, as a result of that, for many people to know him. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Again, thanks for uh, the patience this morning as we had a little trouble getting started. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, and uh, we uh, look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. Join us again. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, thanks Amanda. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Dave. Bye.